$1,000 in the auction tomorrow for this trio in the sale. It will save the money for his college education. And on the opportunity to meet President Reagan, Jim said, it's good to meet the President anytime, but especially through 4-H. Mr. President, Jim Lederbrand. Sheep Contest, 1986 Grand Champion Weather at the Illinois State Fair Junior Livestock Show. It was owned by Noelle Flessner, 17. Noelle is the daughter of Nolan and Catherine Flessner of Augusta in Hancock County in Western Illinois, Mr. President. This is the sixth year in a row that she's shown sheep at the fair. Noelle's winning weather is a 132-pound purebred Suffolk named Pee Wee Herman. She's not sure how much money she'll get, but she hopes to use the record for college. Sixth grand champion Barrow in the State Fair Junior Livestock Show is owned by Kevin Kelly, who's 14. Kevin is the son of David and Janet Kelly of Roseville in Warren County, also in western Illinois. The winning Barrow, Herb, weighed in at 235 pounds, made him the lightest pig in the heavyweight Hampshire class. He won't complain if he breaks the record for the Barrow tomorrow. He probably will go to the University of Illinois, and we hope he'll go back to the farm. Mr. President, Kevin Kelly. President, the 1986 Grand Champion Steer in the Illinois State Fair is owned by Ron Elliott, 14, son of Bill and Elaine Elliott of Greenview in Bernard County in Southern Illinois. The winning steer is Frosty, a Kianina, Maine, Anju, Angus crossbred, weighing 1,330 pounds. He's had an average daily gain of 3.2 pounds. Ron is an honor student, president of his freshman class at Greenview High School and a member of the FFA, and is going to use the money from the steer for college. Mr. President, Ron Elliott. President, we like to believe that you're attending the finest state fair in the nation. Last year, a million people visited this fair. <laughs> Mr. President, this is Agriculture Day at the state fair, but since last week, it's all run away. Thank you, thank you all. Governor Thompson, Secretary Ling, and ladies and gentlemen, I look out on you 4-H'ers and future farmers of America. I see your proud faces, and I think of all you know about farming and livestock. And I look in particular at these prize winners back here, and I think to myself, I could use some of you out on the ranch. But there's nothing I enjoy more than, well, getting out here and the homeland. And one of the great things about being at this state fair is that maybe I can tell a joke that they wouldn't understand so well in Washington. It has to do with an old fellow who had a piece of creek bottom land, never had done anything with it. Then he got ambitious to start it in. And he got the brush all cleared and he hauled the rocks away and then he started fertilizing and cultivating and planting. And finally, he had really a beautiful garden spot there. And one Sunday morning after the church service, he was so proud, he asked the minister if he wouldn't stop by and see what he'd done. Well, after church, the minister did come by. And the first thing he saw was the corn. And he said, I've never seen corn so tall. My, how the Lord has blessed this land. 
And then he saw some melons. He said, I've never seen melons that large. He said, oh, the Lord has just bless the Lord. This is just so wonderful. Well, he went on that way through everything, squash and beans and everything else. And the old boy was getting pretty fidgety as the minister kept giving the Lord the credit. And finally, he interrupted and said, Reverend, I wish you could have seen this place when the Lord was doing it by himself. <laughs> I've always, I've always liked that story because it makes a good point. God gave us this great and good land, but it's up to us to make it flourish, to preserve its freedom, to see it grow and become a nation of greatness. In a few minutes, I'll be talking to those people out of the grandstand about the future of American farming. I thought I'd talk to you for a moment about the future more generally, because you've got more future than most of us have. And I thought I might begin my remarks about the future by talking about the past, in particular the part of the American story that I've witnessed in my own lifetime. When I was about your age, if you can take your minds back that far, I, America was in the midst of the Great Depression. And I know you've known of recession since, but I can assure you, to those of us who went through the Great Depression, there was never anything like it. The unemployment rate was virtually a fourth or more of the workforce in America. And I approached college and knew that I was going to have to work my way through. We, uh, we, were, we were poor, but you know you weren't so aware of it because the government didn't keep coming around and telling you you were. So I had to work my way through college, and I was kind of lucky. I had a summer job all the way, lifeguarding get some money to start back to school, and then I had jobs on the campus. As a matter of fact, one of the better jobs I've ever had was on the campus. I washed dishes in a girl's dormitory. <laughs> All around me, it was a tragic time. Your friends, their parents, out of work. America's future looked grim. But here it is just a half a century later, the American people enjoying a standard of living undreamed of during the 30s or even during the boom years of the 20s before the Great Depression. And in these 50 years, employment in America has risen by tens of millions. Real disposable income per person has gone up by over 200 percent. And life expectancy has increased by more than 14 years. As a matter of fact, I've already lived some 20 years longer than my life expectancy when I was born. That's a source of annoyance to a number of people. <laughs> Just think, think of all we take for granted today that didn't even used to exist. Things like television, computers, and space flights. You're looking at a fellow who can actually remember what a thrill it was to hear that Charles Lindbergh had landed in Paris flying that little single-engine plane across the Atlantic all by himself, the first time it had been done. Well, this same fellow also happens to remember what it was like to gather around the TV set and watch the first Americans walk on the moon. Imagine it from Charles Lindbergh to moon landings in a single lifetime. I can remember my first ride in an automobile. And they wonder why I'm an optimist. But what about your generation? You wonderful young people. You stand on the verge of a new age. Today, freedom is on the march throughout the world. Just 10 years ago, for example, there were few democracies in Latin America. Now, 90% of the people in Latin America live in democracies or countries that are well on their way at, in that direction. Peace itself is moving to a surer footing with arms talks and the research in our strategic defense initiative. Our economy is growing as America leads the world in a technological revolution, a revolution ranging from tiny microchips to voyages through the outer reaches of the solar system, from home computers to agricultural breakthroughs like new disease-resistant crops. And for those of you who are going into farming, the future is especially bright as the world population continues to grow, creating new markets. All this awaits you. Of course, you'll fe face challenges. Every generation has to face challenges as it comes of age. But you need only to be true to the values that made our nation great. I know when you're young, believe it or not, 
your parents and the others that are older, they remember very clearly what it was like and how they felt, the same as, it, as you do. But there's a tendency to throw aside old values belonging to an earlier generation. Don't discard those values that have proven over the time, the period of time, their value. Just believe in those values that made our nation great and keep them. Faith, family, hard work, and above all, freedom. Well, I know it's, it's time for me to get ready to speak to that other audience outside. And I want you to know that I've taken advantage of you because I appreciated having this time with you and I tried to stretch it out a little bit. But I just want to again thank you, all of you, and God bless you. Backstage here, that the idea for Farm Aid took form. Okay. Government assistance has its limits, but the helping hands of America, the volunteer spirit, knows no bounds. These are trying times for many farmers, but the future can be bright. State government of Illinois is working towards that future. The task force on the future of rural little one farm state, we have a special pride. Farmers help other farmers, and state borders don't get in the way. And backstage this morning, the President of the United States said a simple thank you to the proud farmers of Illinois. To our native son, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. chicken have three legs? Four. Farmer says, yep, I raise them that way. Well, he said, why? Well, he said... <laughs> some four million acres of marginal farmland, fragile land that was undergoing rapid erosion. By the end of next year, that figure will rise to nearly 10 million. And when the program is complete, to almost 45 million acres. That's 45 million acres out of production and protecting the environment. 
45 million acres conserved for future generations, not used to force crop prices down in our time. I mentioned a moment ago, with bumper harvest here in the Midwest, storage is scarce. And some producers fear lack of space in elevators or farm bins will make their crops ineligible for price supports. Well, I've directed Secretary of Agriculture Lynn to make certain that grain... My father was always looking for a better job. But I'd be honest with you, if I added in there a brief time in Chicago, time in Galesburg, time in... Presented to you by Sarah Stevenson, Illinois State Fair Queen for 1986. All right.